Hello and welcome to another entry in the Astrologer's Encyclopedia. My name is Matt. Thank you so much for joining me as always. Um, today we're going to be talking about the moon and its uh, progression of signification through time from the ancient Greek astrologers to uh, today. So basically what we're going to be doing is reading a bunch of sources. Um, I'll put the quotes on the screen and then uh, sort of synthesize them into a list of uh, significations that you can use. And the point here isn't necessarily to be like perfect at reading the moon. You know, you'll watch this presentation and then be able to read the moon, you know, in a bunch of charts. That's not necessarily what we're trying to do. More so, we're trying to trace the evolution of the significations, like I just said, um, and see how they've changed, how they've adapted to different cultures, how they've uh, certain things have been added and lost over time. Um, and just to give you a sense that, you know, if you are a modern astrologer, that there used to be different significations. And if you're someone who is really into traditional astrology, give you maybe a more um, modern, like psychological sense. So before we start, uh, if you are enjoying this channel, I would really appreciate your support on Patreon. You can also find me on Twitter um, and I will have links to that down below. Um, so let's just get right into it. So... Starting off here, we are going to be talking about the moon today. Um, quick table of contents. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the moon in traditional astrology and reading from Valens, Firmicus, Abu Mashar, and William Lilly. Um, and so usually when people say traditional astrology, and what I mean by traditional astrology is the period of forever ago to about the 18th century. Um, so we have the Greeks, the Arabs, the medieval Latin astrologers, and then the uh, like Renaissance vernacular astrologers, so people writing in English and German and French. Um, and then through to around the Enlightenment period, where astrology really died out, especially in the West, and then uh, was revived in modern astrology. So there's this continuous tradition for over 2,000 years, from the Babylonian astrologers, to the Greek astrologers, to the medieval Arab astrologers, to the Latin astrologers, to the Renaissance astrologers. And then there's this break in the tradition, and then we see this revival uh, in the 1800s and especially in the 20th century um, where things become much more psychological, things become much more individual, things become much less um, broad and sort of like uh, complicated isn't the right word, but the traditional astrologers tended to see things in a more holistic sense, you could say, you know, Robert Schmidt has this idea of the uh, astrological chart representing the like cosmic mind and the cosmic soul, rather than representing something about the individual soul, like only. So that is the focus in modern astrology. We'll get to that. So we will read from Stephen Forrest, Ren Butler, um, and Richard Tarnas for modern significations. And then we'll just take a quick look at some special lunar considerations, uh, like the phases and the void of course moon that are unique to the moon. And starting off the moon in traditional astrology, this is uh, Valens. We have two page quote from Valens says, the moon is born from the reflection of the solar light and possessing a counterfeit light. So it does not contain its own light signifies in a nativity, man's physical life, the body, the mother conception, form, appearance, goddess living together and lawful marriage, nurse, older sibling, housekeeping, the queen, the mistress of the house, possessions, fortune, city, gathering of the masses, gains, expenditures, home, boats, travel, wanderings, since it does not hold straight due to the crab, cancer. Of the parts of the body, she rules the left eye, the stomach, breasts, the breath, the spleen, membranes, and marrow, from which it produces dropsy. Of substances, she rules silver and glass. She is of the nocturnal sect, light green in color, salty in taste. So we see here kind of a mixture of um, like psychological characteristics and, um, but it's like mainly things in the world, right? So we have like the form of things, the appearance of things because of the changing light of the moon, marriages, nurses, older siblings, housekeeping, um, the queen, people, all of those kinds of things are like objects, right? In the world or like things that you will encounter in life. Um, but it also represents the body, the physical life, especially so that the physical life is really, really important in the traditional significations and kind of drops away a lot of times in modern significations. So that is Valens. And that, uh, is Chris Brennan's translation. That's in his book, Hellenistic Astrology, page 169 to 170. 
It's worth going to his book and reading it also because each one of these words has footnotes. There's like this much text and like this much footnotes because the Greek words are really complicated and layered and um, have like many different meanings. So he uses the footnotes to kind of expand on those. So next we have uh, from Firmicus, uh, like third or fourth century Latin astrologer. He was a, a Roman lawyer. Says, quote, for after the breath of life has become established in the completed human being, and after the spirit of the divine mind has infused itself into his body, the moon sustains the form of the composed body according to the quality of her courses. Okay. So we have here again, pretty much just saying the moon, and he goes on, uh, there's like a couple more paragraphs, but this is, I think, all I really wanted to put down. So the moon as physical life, the moon as container for the soul, and the moon as uh, something that the quality of her courses really means like the applications that she makes to other planets. And we're going to get to that. So the moon is something that is very changeable, that is very flexible and adaptive to influences and uh, characterizes the body specifically because it waxes and wanes, right? The sun would be, like Balance is saying, um, reflection of the solar light. That's like the spirit principle, right? You think of like the lot of spirit or the house of good spirit, something like that. That's a solar signification. The moon is like the house of the spirit. So the spirit is eternal, is everlasting, is like outside of time more so than maybe eternal. And the moon reflects the way that life is born, matures and dies, right? So the moon, because it is being filled with the solar light and then emptying constantly, reflects the ever-changing nature of like the body, the physical life, right? It's never quite the same. You're always going through some sort of um, change. Okay. So this is Abu Mashar. He's... Um, I think writing in like the eighth or ninth century. Um, he is one of the early uh, medieval Arab astrologers. And he says, as for the moon, she is the luminary of the night and her nature is cooling, moist, phlegmatic, and she is light, suitable in every affair, craving joy and beauty of character and being praised. And she indicates the inception of all works and kings, the nobles, good fortune, decency in religion, the higher sciences, wonders and sorcerers and abundance of thoughts about things and premonition so here we see a couple of additions one uh being things like uh the mind right that is present in the hellenistic period but to probably a lesser degree i think but we see like the higher sciences sorcerers and abundance of thoughts so we see the mind here is something that is quickly changing something that is um, adaptable to different circumstances uh, and so forth and then we also see like temperament um, qualifications like the moon being phlegmatic and wet um, and that kind of thing. And then also she indicates the inception of all works. So this is again, I think referring to the uh, quality that the moon has of like collecting the influences of other planets and bringing them into form um, on earth. But see, again, here, we don't really have these uh, psychological significations like phlegmatic would describe someone's temperament, um, but it's not psychological in the way that we tend to think of it. Um, and there, you notice there are not really any relations to like feelings or emotions or those kinds of things. It's uh, it's mental for sure, and it's religious, but it's not quite emotional, right? And so, you know, we do see things like balance talking about mothers and nurturing and nurses and these kinds of things, which is also a modern signification. But you don't quite have that emotional um, quality. So, uh, and this is uh, from again Abu Mashar quoted in Charles Obert's book. Uh, Seven Classical Planets, Source Texts and Meanings, really good book. Um, and then, so that's on page 47 in that book. And then we have William Lilly saying, when the moon is well-placed, we see composed manners, a soft, tender creature, a lover of all honest and ingenious sciences, a searcher of and delighter in novelties, natural, naturally propense to frit and shift his habitation. When poorly placed, uh, we see a mere vagabond, an idle person, hating labor, a drunkard, a sot, I don't know what that is. Uh, one of no spirit or forecast delighting to live beggarly. So here we start to see like more character analysis, more psychology, you could kind of say. Um, and so when well-placed, you know, that would mean like if the moon is in cancer, if it's angular, if it's um, in Taurus, if it has triplicity rulership, if it has a good relationship with benefics, and then when poorly placed would be, you know, in Capricorn or in Scorpio or in a bad house or with a malefic or something like that, right? It, it would... Uh, inflect poorly, um, excuse me, upon the character. So we see here, and this is like another sort of thousand year jump almost from 
Abu Mashur to Lily, and I'm skipping over like all of the other medieval astrologers and all of the Renaissance astrologers. But we see here, um, we start to kind of shift away from, and Lily has a lot more to say about like places that the moon signifies or uh, types of um, occupations or things like that, you know? And so we do see that as well, but we start to see a little bit more like character significations. So just to sort of synthesize that, the traditional significations of the moon, we see uh, the light of the nocturnal sect. Sect is a concept that is entirely missing from modern astrology. The domicile is Cancer. She's exalted in Taurus. She's the nocturnal ruler of the earth triplicity. So the primary ruler of the earth triplicity. So in a night chart, the moon would be the ruler and the cooperating ruler of the water triplicity. Um, she signifies things like the body, health, and the mother, physical life, uh, and the container of the spirit. And so that's going to be very important as we go forward. We start to see the moon being related to the soul rather than the container and the um, body, right? We see the foundation of life. So like the physical health of the native, the material health of the native, uh, things like queens and the people. And so we see if the moon is related to royalty, she's related to the queen and not the king and to like the common things and the people. Um, and then we see growth and decay of things over time. This is like of absolutely vital importance, this growth and decay signification, because it's anything that like changes face, anything that is one thing in one moment and another thing in the next would be lunar rather than solar. The solar principle is things that are unchanging and not subject to like life and death in the same way as the moon. Um, and then we see things travel uh, and things that move or are unstable and are constantly changing form. So that's kind of similar to that other thing, but you see things like, um, you know, with the third house being related to travel to familiar places um, or, you know, changing forms, you might see the moon as like a thief or again, as the body, right? So um, something that is constantly changing face, there can be sometimes notions of deception and like trickiness um, with the moon. There's uh, significations of the night and the things that come out of the night. Um, and things that sort of like spring forth from darkness, right? Like perhaps a body, like a human body. Um, so things like that. And things that are like not illuminated on their own, but need to be illuminated, right? So it's really interesting that like they even understood at the time that, you know, they had no idea that the moon was what it was. They had no way of knowing the things that we know today about the moon, but they knew that the moon was not emitting its own light. They knew that it was the sun's light um, reflecting off of the moon and, um, bouncing back to earth so that is just something to really like turn over in your brain like what that means um that for like this whole paradigm this whole worldview of like the moon is is inert the moon is matter and the sun is the enlivening vivifying principle of that like brings itself into the moon into matter and like brings it to life right and so this, the the sun is like infused in all of reality. It's not just like human bodies, but like anything that's alive, which for ancient astrologers was everything was like the cosmos, right? Um, is like a combination of, of the sun and the moon. So just something to think about. And it's, I think it's much more subtle and much more broad and, and sort of vast than the modern significations. Not that they're wrong, but they're just uh, sort of doing different things. So one thing that's really important in, traditional astrology is this notion of separations and applications of the moon to other planets. Um, and so we see that the moon is going significantly faster than any other planet. You know, the next fastest would be like Mercury, right? But so the sun goes around and all of the other inner planets go around in about a year or two, right? So, uh, and then the moon goes around in a month. So as the swiftest and closest planet to earth, the moon is said to gather up the different influences of the other planets and bring them into form on earth, right? So we see that signification of physical things, physical manifestation, physical form. Um, and the spirit and like the influences of the other planets needing like a form to exist on earth, right? Rather than just somewhere up in the ether. So this is Demetra George uh, in her book, uh, Ancient Astrology and Theory and Practice Volume 1, saying, it follows that if the moon applies to a planet, she is able to help bring down and make manifest the significations of that planet into the terrestrial realm. Thus, an application from the moon improves a planet's condition by bringing its matters to fruition. That's a really interesting notion, I think, that it improves a planet's condition, right? So it's, especially in ancient astrology, there are all these notions of like busyness and profitability and action, right? And so they're, they're, um, connecting a good life and like a satisfying life to one that is like functional on earth. 
and not always one that is like super, super spiritual and like up here, right? It's one that is able to bring things from up here and drag them down to earth and put them into a concrete form. And so if the moon is like applying to good planets, then that's really good because like the influences of Jupiter of like justice and influence and authority will be brought into form in the native's life and, and, and be busy and active, right? Um, so Paulus says that the applications within three degrees are effective and occur early in life. So let's say, I should have put a chart up here, but let's say you have the moon um, at like, my moon's at, at 10 degrees Aries. And then let's pretend that I had um, Mars at 13 degrees Aries or 12 degrees Aries. That application would occur early in life. So you would see the influence of Mars being present early in life and being very effective and active, right? So that would be probably not good. Uh, but if Mars is in Aries, you know, maybe it's not bad, especially if it's a night chart, right? So we would see like early in life, there's not really a specific age, but let's say like, um, you know, childhood and early adulthood, right? Would be the influence of Mars. I think would be particularly active, perhaps violent, competitive, might be involved in sports, these kinds of things. And then if there is, let's again, pretend the moon is at 10 degrees Aries and Mars is at 15 Aries, between three and seven degrees occur in midlife, that influence would be brought into form in midlife. So let's say from around like the Saturn return to the second Saturn return or something like that, right? Um, that influence of Mars would be present from seven to 15 degrees would occur in later years. So maybe after the second Saturn return or like in your fifties or sixties or something. And then between 15 and 30 in old age. So this can cross sign boundaries. It always will if it's between 15 and 30 degrees, but you can see this chain of of planets that the moon will hit like right in a row. And so this is um, applications and separations being like conjunctions or any aspect, right? So let's say again, the moon could be at 10 Aries and uh, you know Venus could be at 20 Aquarius. That would be between seven and 15 degrees. That sextile from Venus would occur later in life, right? So we would see like marriages and relationships and um, profit from religion and temples and women would be occurring later in life in like an old age, right? Uh, or in like the late middle years, something like that, right? Um, and so just like I've been saying, the flow of separation and application indicates increases in good or bad over the lifetime according to the planets involved. So let's say that we have, again, the moon at 10 Aries, we have Mars at 13 Aries and Venus at 20 Aquarius, right? So the moon will hit Mars Early in life, there will be like a Martian character to the early life. So things like perhaps injuries and violence, battles, competition, conflict, strife, all those kinds of things. Um, and then we'll hit Venus at 20 Aquarius later in life, and there will be an improvement, like a direct improvement. But if we reverse that, there would be like the earlier part of life would be infused with Venusian qualities of relationships and sex and wine and, and you know, hopefully not when you're a child, but you, you get what I'm saying. And then would move on to Mars to be like... Uh, misfortune and Martian, specifically misfortune, according to the nature of the aspect and the sign later in life. So this is really important. And this is also something that I think is kind of lost in modern astrology. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong. So this is just, this is like of absolutely vital importance in, in ancient astrology, because the moon is the one again, to bring things down to earth. It's the container for all physical things that come to be and mature and change and die. Right. So now moving on to the moon in modern astrology. Um, this first quote is from Stephen Forrest, uh, The Inner Sky. So he says, and there's a whole like uh, chapter, it's only a couple of pages, but it's definitely worth reading if you want a sense of the modern significations. Uh, and this came out in the 80s. I think it was like 1984 or 89 or something. I think my edition is from 89. But anyway, the function of the moon is the development of the ability to feel or respond emotionally, the development of subjectivity, impressionability, and sensitivity, the development of what we might call a soul. Isn't that really interesting? They just dropped the body. They just changed the soul from the sun to the moon. And then dysfunction would be emotional self-indulgence, timidity, laziness, wishy-washiness, overactive imagination, indecision, and moodiness. So here we see like the negative aspects of loving that is constantly changing. So like self-indulgence where it's like you can't hold a will for a long time, right? Where there's like this, oh, well, you know, I know I should like, work out, but I'm not, you know what I mean? Something like that. Or timidity, laziness, wishy-washiness. So yeah, I know I said I would do this, but like, I'm actually, things are different now. Overactive imagination, living sort of pie in the sky and not being able to ground things physically. Indecision and moodiness, kind of the same thing. But the positive qualities are all about feeling. Um, and they're not related in, in 
such a specific way to things that like Abu Mashar was talking about, about like religious life or science or um, the people or things like that, or like praise or attention, right? It's all about, can you have a healthy relationship to your emotions? Can you have a healthy relationship to your body? Which is, I think, implicit. It's not really um, explicit where like, if you have a healthy relationship with your emotion, you have to have a healthy relationship with your body because the emotions live in the body. Um, but the development of what we might call a soul is really uh, funny to me where it's like a total flip where it's, and we're going to do a video on the sun eventually, but it's Valens is like, the sun is the soul, the, na the nature's intellectual light, right? It's, it's just totally opposite. And the moon is the container for the soul. Um, so that's just worth noting. I'm not here. I'm not saying like, I'm not, I don't want to be bashing modern astrology because they, they really do do different things, um, traditional and, and modern astrology, but it's just worth noting, I think. Um, the next one is from Ren Butler uh, in his book, The Archetypal Universe, I think is what it's called. Um, yeah, it's not, yeah, it's Archetypal Universe. And so he says, uh, there's like the positive characteristics and the negative characteristics again. It says, uh, the impulses towards nurture and mothering, rootedness and connection in a home, family, and community, our capacity to feel, process, and reflect on our emotions, qualities of depth and soul, again, this soul is, is I think, in a different way than what they might have meant in the ancient world, like a soulfulness as in like a beauty and like a um, like a depth of feeling and character, right? Like you think of like soulful music doesn't really necessarily reflect something of like the sun, but it's like this, I guess it does, you know, it's like this sort of transcendent like depth of, of feeling, but this is being uh, associated with the mood. So the negative qualities would be, or like the more difficult or, Problematic perhaps would be excessive emotionality and reactivity, moodiness or dependency, an unwillingness to grow up or leave home. That's a really interesting one to me. Um, indiscriminate helping instincts. So again, here we see the positive ones uh, relate to qualities of connection, relationship, family, uh, community, um, and feelings, right? And an ability to like process and reflect on emotion. So you see, again, this is like more related to the body explicitly than uh, like Stephen Forrest. And this book I think came out in like 2018. So this is really recent. Um, but you see like callbacks to things like families, the people, um, connections to the mother, the ability to nurture and care for things and grow things right over time. Um, that would be the positive aspects. And then the negative ones are just like the same sort of thing as the inner sky where it's like a emotions are sort of running wild or are inadequate in some way where there's um like moodiness or dependency and an unwilling unwillingness to leave home right so there's like this this immaturity that is implied with the moon sometimes or this um overly attached nature or this like excessively changing um and like uncommitted nature right would be like a negative aspect of the moon and so in modern astrology i think you know and i'm not i'm less of a modern astrology scholar than a traditional one um, but, you know, I think when they talk about like positive and negative, they really, um, they're not necessarily talking about like the moon in Capricorn versus the moon in Cancer. They're talking about like the native's choices and the ability of the native to uh, sort of grow spiritually over time. So the last uh, quote that we're going to look at here is from Richard Tarnas. And this is, again, definitely worth reading the whole quote. There's more to it than what I've included here. I just didn't want to read for like 20 minutes. Um, so this is from page 90 of Cosmos and Psyche from 2006, I believe. It says, the moon is the matrix of being, the psychosomatic foundation of the self, the womb and ground of life, the body and the soul, that which senses and intuits, the feeling nature, the impulse and capacity to gestate and bring forth, to, to receive and reflect, to relate and respond, to need and care, to nurture and be nurtured. So this is um, contains a lot, right? So we have um, the body and the soul is, again, really, really interesting that that the soul is now lumped in with um, the moon. And, you know, I guess you can see it in traditional astrology where it's like the moon does contain the soul in the sense that it's the house for it, but it doesn't signify the soul. It signifies the body, which is the container of the soul. Um, and then we see, again, things like feelings, the senses, which again, the body, um, the feeling nature, impulse and capacity to gestate. So this quality of changing and growing and decaying over time. Um, receiving again, receiving the light of the sun and reflecting the light of the sun to relate and respond, same thing to need and care to nurture and be nurtured. So it's like, it's all related to physical life, but it's just a little less explicit and it's more grounded in things like psychology and, and the 
the capacity of people to do things psychologically and relate. Um, you know, he says the psychosomatic foundation of the self. That's, I think, probably the best phrasing of that, like succinctly, is in modern astrology, the moon is the psychosomatic foundation of the self. So the feelings, the body, the nurturing, the food, the connection to the mother, right? Um, and so you see how all these things are like related to traditional astrology, but there's like a a jump that's made right between William Lilly and and between the rest of the modern astrologers, right? Um, just very interesting. So, um, modern significations—the way to boil it down—is that they focus almost exclusively on emotion and feeling. Things like the rhythm of your feelings and emotions, adjustment or maladjustment to adult life. So, how do you handle the ups and downs of life? How can you respond with your body, with your emotions, to things that happen to you in life? Can you? adjust to them do you need more support do you need like too much support you know whatever that means um are you like unable to be independent again whatever that means um we see significations of the mind groups of people and the body um have dropped away somewhat so the body maybe not so much but especially the mind and like groups of people um in a way there's a way in which they remain where you see things like community um connection in a home but it seems much more familial than um than like the moon would be like society or like the city like the city's population right rather than just like your immediate like nuclear family um and so you know this is all related to it's like traditional astrology and modern astrology like i said do very different things um and the way that i like to sum it up is that the unit of measurement like when we look at a chart from a modern perspective we are looking at the individual right the the light the inner emotional mental spiritual life of the individual when we look at a chart in a hellenistic or traditional sense we're looking at the life of the native part of that life is the individual but it's a little bit different right and so there's and i said it at the beginning there's this thing that robert schmidt says where it's when you're looking at a chart when the original Hellenistic astrologers were looking at a chart, what they were looking at was the, the mind of like the cosmic being, which has a body and a, and a soul and a mind um, at the moment of birth. And so there's like, and he says this, this it's a, um, his lectures on like the bringing Hellenistic astrology to a modern uh, idiom is that the thoughts in the mind of the cosmic soul are not like one-to-one -one related to your life to, or to your like inner state, right? It relates to your life and the things that happen to you, but it's, there's a jump that you need, that you would have to make to be like, and this is the example he gives of like my Mars and Aquarius, right? He had Mars and Aquarius signifying something about like my sense of anger or aggression in life. Like that's a jump that you have to make that the Hellenistic astrologers would have thought was like really arrogant. Um, so it's just really interesting. And, and, you know, I have had modern readings that are wonderful and it works. Like it has to work. If people have been doing it this much, it works for the things that it's good at. It just is doing different things. And so I think it's really unfair for people to be like, oh, modern astrology is stupid because it doesn't do what Hellenistic astrology does. Or like Hellenistic astrology is stupid because it doesn't do what modern astrology does. They're not doing the same thing. Um, Schmidt would maybe disagree with me there, but it's just worth noting that they are very different. They're related in some ways, but they're very different in their ends and in how they arrive at their conclusions. Um, and they work for a different thing. You get what I'm saying. So special lunar considerations. Um, the lunar phases are really important. So this is not, I'm not going to like break them down really, but th that will be a future video. So just to note that the moon goes around the entire zodiac in about 28 days. So that's the lunar month. During this time, she goes from completely dark new moon so no inert matter, right? Inert matter, there's no spirit in her, right? To completely light full moon filled with spirit has manifested the spirit in physical life and back again. Astrologers divided the lunar cycle in many ways over the centuries. The most common ways are uh, twofold, threefold, fourfold, or eightfold divisions. But there are several ancient authors who divided, uh, and I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but uh, into seven, 10, and 11 phases of uneven length. So in modern times, the most common are like the twofold, fourfold, and eightfold. That was not always true. Um, but again, this is not really the time to dive deep into that. This is just a quick image of, so the earth is here. The sunlight is coming from this direction. Um, and 
all the sunlight is hitting the back of the moon from the Earth's perspective, and we can't see any of it. And then as the moon moves, it goes, um, my arrows, it goes this way, right? So it builds up, it's gathering more light, and then has this first quarter, has the full moon where the Earth is between the sun and the moon, and the sunlight again is coming this way and illuminating the whole face of the moon. The actual amount of light hitting the moon never changes. It's kind of interesting. Um, but from the Earth's perspective, we see uh, the full face of the moon illuminated and then the moon comes back here um, and wanes. And so there's all kinds of stuff written on like, you know, if you're born during a crescent moon, a waxing crescent moon, that means one thing. If you're born during a full moon, that means another thing. Um, this is not the time for that, but just worth noting. Um, so the other important lunar consideration is the void of course moon. Um, comes from the Greek kenodromia, which means running in the void or running in the emptiness. Um, and so this is Demetri George on, uh, in that same book, uh, Ancient Astrology and Theory and Practice, Volume 1. If the moon's primary functions function is to draw down the significance of other planets, dot, 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 while she is void, of course, there is no one for her to connect with and nothing for her to do. So we see all this kind of stuff of like, oh, it's void of course moon, like don't do anything because symbolically nothing will happen. Like if you start and you see this in horror where it's like, if the moon is void, of course, the question, nothing will happen. Like the, the question is, is the matter will be, will, will not happen, right? Nothing will come of it, um, that kind of thing. So that would be the void, of course, moon. It reflects aimlessness, weakness, and liminality. So there's an aimless quality because the moon has nothing to connect to. She's just kind of wandering in the emptiness, right? Uh, weakness, because there's nothing it's too much, right? There's nothing happening. And then liminality, it's in between places, right? It's, it's, there's, again, it's the same thing, nothing to grab onto. It's left one place. It hasn't arrived at the other place. It's not going to anytime soon. You know, it's like a road trip where you have 13 hours left on the road trip. It's like nothing is happening. You know, we're not in a place. We're just traveling, that kind of a thing. And there's like a weakness. There's a vulnerability and a danger even um, in that condition, especially in the ancient world where it's like, if you're traveling for two weeks and you're, or three months, whatever, you're two weeks into the trip, you got a long time to go and you're in a really vulnerable position. You don't know anyone. You're not in a place that you're familiar with. You might not know the land. You have to find food. You're a robber. You know, all these kinds of things are um, reflect the aimlessness, the weakness, and the liminality of uh, the Buddha Course Moon. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, there are two definitions uh, and probably more specific variations of them um, if you really want to split hairs. But the Hellenistic definition is basically that the moon does not make any degree-based aspects in the next 30 degrees, including those it makes after crossing a sign boundary. So again, I should have put a chart up here. So let's say the moon is at um, 15 degrees of Aries, right? And so then the next aspect that it will make is like a conjunction with Mercury at like 19 Taurus or something like that. Um, that's in the next 30 degrees, there's no aspects and it's going to cross a sign boundary in the sign until it hits 30 degrees from where it was originally. There's no aspect. So that's Hellenistic void, of course. Uh, the medieval and modern definition says the moon does not make any aspects before leaving its current sign. Very, very different. The moon can be void, of course, for like an hour if there's a planet at like 29 whatever sign. And then the moon the void, of course, for like that one degree or something like that. So this is much, much, much more common. Um, the Hellenistic void, of course, definition is incredibly rare relative to this. It happens like maybe once or twice a year, um, if that, and it's viewed as like a devastating indication. Like if you have this in a birth chart, it's like really not good because right. The moon is the one who, um, brings things into form. If the moon can't bring anything into form, what is your life? You know, like it's, that's what the, that's what like Valens would say. Um, but the medieval one and the modern one is a little bit uh, softer. It's just kind of like, and I think it was tailored a little bit more towards horary, where it's like if the moon has is going to uh, not make any aspects for leaving the sign and you cast a chart for the horary, it's like, eh, nothing's going to happen, right? That kind of thing. Um, but yeah. So um, that's it. Uh, these are uh, works cited. And for the reading, there's quite a bit of them. There's uh, Chris Brennan's Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune. Firmicus Maternus Mathesis. That I included that because I pulled the quote directly from there. The other quotes I pulled from um, either Chris Brennan for Valens. I pulled uh, the Abu Mashar uh, and Lily quotes from Charles Obert's The Seven Classical, The Classical Seven Planets, Source, Text, and Meaning. Um, a really good book. It's pretty cheap. Um, it's definitely worth picking up. It's just kind of like a reference 
text. Demetri George's Ancient Astrology in Theory and Practice, Volume 1. Uh, those are the traditional sources that I would really recommend. Um, and then we have Stephen Forrest's The Inner Sky, Ren Butler's The Archetypal Universe, Richard Tarnas's Cosmos and Psyche, and then Demetri George's Mysteries of the Dark Moon is a really, really good book for um, like lunar phases and specifically for the dark phase and this um, mythological conception of of the moon's phases with relations to like the triple goddess the archetype it's really 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 good I, re I read it years ago i should read it again i read it like before i got into astrology which is kind of interesting um and then the astrology podcast two episodes i'd recommend are episode 292 defining the void of course moon uh and episode 294 the moon and astrology meanings and uses and then i probably should have included it but whatever episode is about cancer would be related to the moon as well so um that one came out relatively recently um so definitely i would listen to that so uh, thank you very much for watching this. I hope that was useful. Um, and again, the point here isn't like you can look at the moon and be like, this is exactly what's going to happen in your life. More so that you can get a sense of like the historical trajectory, what has happened over the last 2000 years with the moon, the difference between modern and uh, traditional significations and so on and so forth. So um, like I said at the beginning, you can find me on Twitter. If you are really enjoying this, I love making these. I want them to be free forever. I don't want to ever have to charge for astrological education. So I need your help with funding this. Um, I have a day job, but you know, eventually I don't want to have that. Um, so you can find me on Patreon. Uh, you can get things like forecast for three bucks a month, early access for five, uh, additional bonus content for 10 bucks a month. There are um, like new moon live events and stuff for a little bit more, um, but yeah, thank you very much for watching and I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye.